Before we dive into the Singapore's healthcare system today, I thought it may be useful for us to take a step back and to go through briefly how the system has changed over the last 70 years to get to where it is today. I feel that there are some pretty interesting takeaways for this quick history lesson. And yes, since we are now in the election cycle again, some segments of the society again brought up the conversation of CPF drawdown age. I do have some personal opinion here and I'd like to sidetrack and share um, with you as well as we move along. Okay, seems that we have quite a bit to cover today. Uh, let's begin. I probably won't go too far back in time because in the early days during the British colonialism and Japanese occupation of Singapore, there was generally a lack of concerted effort in healthcare planning and delivery of the population. As such, it may be more meaningful to look at it from around the time when Singapore attains self-governance. So back in the 50s, the issue then centered around infections and tropical diseases. As such, the focus of the healthcare delivery and public health then was on mass inoculation programs, vaccinations, and provisions of basic medical care for patients, especially in the rural parts of the island. During that time, we had networks of hospitals and decentralized outpatient dispensaries. Notice that the infant mortality rate then was not fantastic at all. Maternal and child health clinics were also the main focus of the government. These services, interestingly, remain decentralized over the years and we still find them relevant today and are being provided for at our local polyclinics around the country. Life expectancy then was 62 years with major, a majority of the people dying from infectious diseases. Moving on to the 80s, demographics and disease burden started shifting in Singapore. This coincided with a period of rapid economic development in Singapore, which saw it became one of the four Asian dragons with an annual GDP per capita growth rate of more than 7%. As the population became more affluent, notice that the top causes of death had changed from infectious diseases to some early resemblance of chronic diseases similar to what we are having today. It was also around uh, this time that the National Health Plan and the 3M policy were introduced. I will probably make another separate video to talk about 3M in the future. During this period, we also had restructuring of the hospitals. Before this, hospitals were publicly run and in this restructuring exercise, hospitals were grouped into two clusters, Sing Health and NHG. They continue to exist until today. This early inter in the early intention of this privatization move was primarily to encourage competition among the hospitals. This allowed the healthcare system to aggressively innovate and develop cutting edge capabilities. This also helped pave the way for Singapore to compete subsequently in this medical tourism sector. And if you recall, in the 90s, the government was drumming about Singapore becoming a medical tourism hub. This is something that you probably don't hear about that often today. I won't go into the detail of the so-called downfall of the medical tourism sector today, but we can see if we have the chance to probably dive deeper another time. Um, since the restructuring of uh, the healthcare system some 40 years ago, the healthcare system has served us well, but we may be approaching an inflection point soon that some fundamental reforms in the healthcare systems are due. Again, I want to bring your attention to this fantastic growth of our life expectancy over the years. Remember in the 50s, life expectancy was about 62 years old. Since uh, the 1970s, we had an average growth of this figure at about 4 years every decade, every 10 years. And that means that every 10 years, as we progress, the life expectancy of our population grew by 4 years. So what is the implication for us? Coming back to the question about CPF, we probably recall this return our CPF movement back in the last election cycle. I think it is understandable for some quarters of the society to feel kind of angry on the matter. And from my perspective, I attribute that anger to some kind of ignorance as a reason. What they were seeing, and perhaps still applicable to many today, was that their salary or earnings were forcibly taken away from them and put in this compulsory savings account. And the money is there, but there's hardly any way for them to touch or use them. 
the visibility was also kind of poor. So keeping in mind what I shared with you earlier about the life expectancy growth just now, right? Let's take another perspective and relook at this growth. This table was taken from a UN report on aging. The trend of life expectancy at birth reported was consistent with what we went through just now. Four more years of life for every 10 years we move. This number continues to grow, uh, although we, we, we are seeing some kind of plateau, understandably, because we are here all, and uh, there's probably only so much we can prolong our lives through advances in medical technologies and reduction in preventable death. The thing I want to highlight over here in this table is that while our birth cohort say the folks who were born in the year 2000, they had a life expectancy of 78 years at birth. If they are fortunate enough to live until the age of 60, they will have probably another 21.4 years to go by projection. And if they are able to reach 80 years old, they will probably have another 9.1 years more to live before they eventually pass on. Now, here you may see some discordance from the original projection of 78.1 years. Do note that life expectancy at birth applies to the entire birth cohort and a proportion of this cohort will pass on earlier than others, possibly due to congenital diseases, accidents, genetic predisposition, and so on. So for those who are able to live past certain age milestones, the surviving cohort's life expectancy at that point in time will naturally be longer than the original projection for the entire cohort. So coming back to the application, Back in frontline practice, I often hear complaints from patients and these generally fall in one of these two personas. First, I'm 70 years old now and I'm going to die anytime soon. My CPF inside got money. Don't ask me to pay for my bill. Go and take from my CPF. Bank stable. And the second persona, my son's daughter's CPF got money. Use their account. Now, let's look at these statements more closely. In the first statement, you will know from my previous sharing that it is probably not true. A lot of times, people understand that life expectancy incorrectly. The usual life expectancy you hear in the media, the news, the general discussion uh, is life expectancy at birth, and people wrongly apply that single number throughout their lives. In this case, this 80-year-old likely still have more years ahead of him than he could perhaps imagine especially if he was able to walk up to my pharmacy counter and bang the table. In the second statement, it was probably a little bit more worrying for me for two reasons. First, it shows that some of our elderly patient population today already does not have sufficient savings to meet their healthcare needs. In the past, say in the 50s to 70s, people work until the retirement age of between 55 to 62, and uh, from the time when they stop working, um, and therefore goes uh, went without income um, to the day they pass on, it was generally a period of less than 10 years. However, looking at our elderly population today, right, they stopped working between the age of 62 to 65 before the recent extension of 67. They have nearly 20 years ahead of them that is without income that requires them to leave and draw down on their savings. Remember, our population's life expectancy grew four years every 10 years. Compare that with the government's proposal of increasing retirement age from 65 to 67. And that's a two-year uh, period that we're talking about here. And the pushback that you observe and the backlash from the people is, is kind of disproportionate, I feel. And second point is that while using MediSafe of the children may be a quick solution for now, I feel that it is just an act of kicking the can down the road. It is especially so that their children will likely live longer in the future compared to them now or with a longer post-retirement runway. They will also likely need more uh, money for their health care in the future when they became old. Now, as parents, they are already drawing on their children's savings and I really think that it is not healthy and not sustainable. Going back to the trend of aging population, 
Um, Singapore is quite uniquely different from many advanced economies around the world. And probably thanks to the baby boomer um, post-World War II, Singapore enjoyed a period of rapid growth. And now we are seeing much of this rapid increase in the elderly population as well. France, for example, had uh, over a century to react to their aging population, while Singapore only had a mere 19 years for the same amount of increase in elderly population. And this has created quite a bit of strain on our, on our healthcare system over the last 20 years. And you see changes and tweaks along the way to try and address these increasing geriatric diseases, health literacy problem, and the way we finance our healthcare system. If we don't change quick enough, I believe the country may suffer in uh, the not too distant future. And again, this just goes to show that by year 2030, one in every four Singaporeans will be aged above 65. The ratio had been increasing rapidly in the last 20 years. With it and longevity, we are seeing a much higher proportion of the patients today with many chronic diseases. This will inevitably contribute to healthcare costs post-retirement and may set to become worse in the last five years of their lives, where healthcare needs increase exponentially. This is another illustration of rapid increased healthcare needs by our population. In the last 10 years, the number of hospital admissions had been on the rise and the rate became faster in the last five years. Another seemingly worrying trend is um, that today we are not just seeing that this is true among the elderly. Healthcare utilization across all age bands are increasing as well. This really underscores the need to not only focus on the sustainability of healthcare delivery in Singapore for the, for the population that is sick, but also for us to work harder in health promotion. So we really have quite a bit of challenges on our plate. Patients today live longer with more chronic and complex conditions. With it, there will be more hands-off between healthcare professionals. Currently, we are actively looking for ways to manage these challenges. Besides, healthcare is set to become more expensive over the years with more advanced technologies and perhaps more funky treatments. So at some point, we probably got to ask ourselves when and what is enough. If there is a pill or treatment that can prolong my debilitated life for another six months or one year while costing a huge sum to the family or even the taxpayers' money through subsidies or finance, uh, financial assistance, is it worth going for it? This is this also goes back to the conversation about advanced care planning and advanced medical directive that was started some 10 years ago. I know such topics remain a taboo in our local society, but I strongly believe that we've got to continue the conversation. We have covered quite a bit today. To sum up, our population demographic is changing. Our population's healthcare needs are evolving. People are living longer without them realizing it, and with it, our healthcare expenditures are growing as well. Apart from the fact that we need to pursue rational conversations surrounding retirement planning and advanced care planning. Apart from the fact that we need to pursue healthcare transformation, I believe as a nation, the people also ought to start having an honest and rational conversation surrounding retirement planning and advanced care planning. Okay, that's all for today. I hope you'll find the sharing useful. If you like the content, do feel free to like and subscribe. Similarly, if there are issues and topics you'd like me to cover, please comment down below as well. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next video.